just a lot more readily accessible, like stupid simple to contribute and kind of like figure out like what's going on with it and um, just, you know, making it a lot more replicable. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that, that would be awesome to, if we could get that. Um, so the only other comment I had like before we start was how much, um, I know you're using some proprietary tool chain or some stuff that's not, that may not be open source. Is there any way to like, because I'm thinking about maximum replicability, like say we get a bunch of people and they might not have access to the same software. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. uh, totally, yeah. I mean, I think we should definitely like maximize the amount of open source tool chain that we're taking advantage of so that other people can do it without any barrier of entry. I, I think I am pretty much using like mm -hmm. completely open source stuff. Like there's nothing that I use. What about your editor? Or heavily. The editor? So, so yeah, I mean, that's it's kind of like the like uh, the Google Chrome versus Chromium mm. oh, okay. um, debate. Oh, okay. So it's it's a freely available oh, okay. editor, but like they just kind of, there's like an open source core to it. And then they put, oh. I think a couple of proprietary like Microsoft features on top of it. Mm. Um, but like the core of it is open source. Oh, good, good, good. Um, so if somebody used, is it interoperable with the other one, the one that's open source? Um, like interoperable, like what do you like mean? Like if you use them, like say you give them the file from your, like your working files, they'll be able to open them up in the other editor? Yeah, it wouldn't yeah. matter, yeah. Wouldn't, oh, yeah. Okay. oh, okay. Yeah. If that's the case, then they'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, because basically the requirement is that for, for wide-scale process, which, you know, the, just to back up a little bit, with the COVID thing and just all together with the large scale collaborative development, it simply has to be that there are no boundaries to whether a person here or in Africa can access and download the software. And ideally, we translate that eventually into the tool, the mechanical tool chains like, okay, now everyone has access to the printer, to the CNC machines and all of that, that you can truly collaborate. Unlike right now where everyone has different equipment and proprietary whatever protocols and stuff uh, like for example with lab like I just found out about uh, there's some good open source lab projects where they're uh, this one fluid manipulator for genetics that's got open source protocols that everyone uses in a science community now it's an open source thing I found it by looking at the sponsor for sponsors for Oshawa the open source hardware summit and um, they have that they can share the protocols which was like the typical comment there was, oh, well, all these scientists can cannot really collaborate or verify each other's work because they're using different protocols and the same old, same old. So here, like if you have the open hardware, you can also do that with genetics. You can do that with manufacturing. You can do it with everything else. So just the general. Yeah, thing. it's, it's kind of interesting. I've been reading about like um, the open steps format standard, like mm -hmm. the ISO like 10303. Mm -hmm. Uh, standard for like how do you communicate like so you digital mind if I CAD eat here, files. You mind if I eat no, go for it. Still no. off. Didn't have dinner. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. but like, um, so there's this great open standard from the. Are you, are you familiar with like ISO, the International Standards Organization? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for like and step files, but like I found out that while it's like a standard, you the if you want like the full document that tells you all the information, like if you wanted to hook into the standard, it, they charge you money for it. It's just like, yeah, it's not really like an open standard if people got to like fork out $200 or whatever to buy your PDF. You know, yeah, that's that. um, that's interesting. And that that's actually, when we were looking into all this stuff for the Open Building Institute, like this house right here, that's the CDCA home where I'm at right now. Uh, you have seen that online, right? Probably. Yeah, definitely. So we we're looking at the building codes, and you can't get your hands on a copy of the building codes <laughs> to see mm -hmm. like exactly what like for free. Like there's there was a whole bunch of stuff like this where you've got like they call it like an open standard, but it's behind a paywall as far as yeah how you you know what's actually in it. So it's not like re it's open, sure. Like anyone can get it if you have two hundred dollars or fifty bucks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Which is always just not very open. Yeah. Well, it's just like just limiting the collaboration possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. 
but what did we want to go over? Uh, yeah, so I think that you have some ideas about what do we want to accomplish in the next 90 days, and I have some ideas, and so maybe we could kind of align your ideas with my ideas and kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. get more on the same page, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe uh, let me share my screen. I can pull up the proposal. Okay. Mm-hmm. You see it now? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, I think we we accomplished a lot of good stuff the first phase, and then I think the primary goal of the second phase is to kind of go back over everything, document it really well, document the patterns. Think more about how the different you know components of the software fit together, like what would be applicable to other workbenches and not applicable. Mm -hmm. um, so that way that we can maximize the replicability of the prior work and make it more accessible for somebody else to come on board and be like, okay, like uh, this new guy is interested in OSE, like he has some interest in tractors because he's maybe has like an agricultural background so that's what his biggest interest is and he wants to contribute to the tractor workbench um, you know like let's give him like let's make that really really easy um, so that he can just like you know start going and contributing mm -hmm. to it um, are you thinking so, of somebody that's that's also like somebody who know, knows Python already or someone who doesn't um, I mean, I would say somebody who who knows. Yeah. Like my focus is not on like teaching programming or Python necessarily, mm -hmm. um, because there's already so much great information out there on the net and other people that teach that and focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, mine would be like, you know, how do you create a free CAD programming workbench and mm -hmm. like also in particular like OSC mm -hmm. needs. Because yeah. those aren't very well covered by other people already. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's good. But yeah, I mean, I definitely would want to make everything like you know stupid simple so that anyone, even if you don't have like a strong programming background, could mm -hmm. kind of figure out um, what's going on and potentially contribute. And yeah. and to, with software projects, like there are other ways. Like you don't have to contribute code. You can write documentation. You can uh, create issues, you can do bug reports, like there's lots of different ways that somebody who's not necessarily a coder like could contribute to a software project. How would you be able to document a piece of code if you don't know coding? Well like you can create user guides right so you can like document like you need to click this button and type in this information and you know do these steps and that's how you generate a cut list or something. Okay. Uh -uh. So, so user testing and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I I feel strongly that like there are certain practices that are kind of you know industry best standards, and I really want to be mm -hmm. following like what's the industry best practices around writing software that's good and maintainable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so some of those uh, standards. And that we want to be following is, you know, having good documentation, uh, having unit tests, and there's also a concept of like kind of like an end-to-end -end or integration test, and that's like more like actually simulating um, like users clicking buttons in FreeCAD and like generating a part and you know doing certain manipulations with that part. Um, so that would be more of like an end-to-end -end integration test. So maybe we could get there eventually. Um, so um, testing, auto automated testing would be one. Um, Go ahead. Let's see. In your write-up there, do you doc? So you said um, so. There's there's testing procedures that you can automate. And what was the like the end-to-end -end testing is the next level? Yeah, I don't have that covered here. I don't think we're gonna get to that. But like maybe in a future state it okay. is something that's kind of on my radar okay okay and the best practices are like where do you uh, find the best practices for code like yeah uh, I mean <laughs> people have read wrote books on it like there's there's one book that I can think of off the top of my head is like called clean code and it's just mm -hmm. you know people who have you 
been software professionals their whole life and they write chapters upon chapters of what they feel are like makes good code versus bad code. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, since I'm in the field, I just kind of have it all in my head. Okay. I don't really have it like written down, but you'd want to document like somewhere in the project, like here are like the patterns we're following. Like in Python, a popular one is like, there's like a, an official Python style guide that tells you like how your code should be formatted. Mm -hmm. And so, like that would be something that would be documented in the contributing guidelines of the project. And we'd say, like, you should adhere to these formatting style guides when you submit code, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, or you should write unit tests if, like, the logic is really complex. So that that should all be well documented in like how to contribute to the project okay. as best practices. Yep. Yep. Um. So yeah, uh, the other kind of piece of this is whenever I was getting everything to work, I wasn't necessarily thinking about how this could apply to other workbenches and like how mm -hmm. to make it super reusable and uh, k kind of general. So that would be just me kind of going through it and kind of stripping out what we feel like would be applicable to other workbenches. Like, like cut list generation is one thing that I could think of that would be something that would kind of be common. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You probably have better ideas uh, about what else would be. Well, which which was uh, I w what I was thinking is that maybe like after we go through the spec, we can uh, actually work on that a little bit and actually list, okay, here's the critical things. We should come up with that together. OK. Um, so another idea that I had was we could have a project that kind of scaffolds out or generates uh, repository for a new workbench. Mm -hmm. So it, you'd run a single command in the command line and then it would assemble like the directories and all the files you need and like a little bit of boilerplate code to kind of get you going mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with something simple like so you could run a command and then have a workbench that does something simple with like click a button and create a box or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then people could kind of start from there. Yeah, I think that would be excellent because then on top of that, it's about more commands, like logic. But yeah, if we can have that basic scaffolding, that would help tremendously. Yeah, so that's kind of like what this OSC workbench generator would be. And then it kind of creates all these other ones. And then they all depend upon this kind of core library or framework that encapsulates that uh, like common functionality. Yeah, yep. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's kind of the basic idea. I wrote as a stretch goal, like, kind of cover FreeCAD workbench programming in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if we'll get there in 90 days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe let's go into... Yeah, you have a good list here, I think. Yeah, that's a good good start. I don't know if we can add anything else to that. But um, you also mentioned, so you mentioned things like README contributing. Yeah, I think con the contributor guide is a good thing. Yeah, get... GitHub has really good documentation. I know I saw you looking at mm -hmm. some of the stuff, like mm -hmm. how to get um, sponsorship and get paid. Um, but yeah, I've been trying to kind of follow this about like what kind of GitHub's advice is for mm -hmm. good things to include in your open source project. Um, but yeah, like README, license contributing. Um, this idea of like continuous integration and continuous delivery in software. Uh, so you'd be set up for those concepts. That's another like industry standard best practice. Um, so can you tell me, for, tell me how like in, how did you implement continuous integration when you were doing it for the first bench? Yeah, sure. Um, so my general process was that like we have a, a main uh, base branch called master. Mm -hmm. And then when I want to add a new feature, like let's say I'm going to add the um, corner generation, I would create a branch for that off of master. I would work on that, do my feature, and then I'm going to pu push my branch up. So right now I was kind of working on the ability to rotate a, the frame, which you can't do yet, and attach axes to it. Um, so when I push that branch, I have all of my unit tests run and ensure that everything still works. Mm -hmm. And then there's a continuous integration tool called Travis CI, 
which if you click on this build passing badge, uh, it'll go to it. So um, I'll see master is good, so it's green, all the tests passed. Um, but if we look at my other branches, like my rotate frame branch, you can see that this failed the, the test. So I know that if I merge this branch into master, like I would create a bug. Mm -hmm because something that it broke something. So this is kind of like a, a way to ensure that you're able to continuously deliver the software because you're not going to be like regressing and pushing new bugs when you're adding new features. So what did this do here? So you test the, the Travis CI was about allowing you to do these tests in a visual way so that you can see which you can put back to it to the to the main. Um, yeah, so it'll basically uh, run all the, your, your test suite with the code in the branch that you pushed. And then it'll tell you, is that um, build failing or passing? Before you actually do that build on GitHub? Or before you... No, it, well, before you like merge it back into the, the master right, base you... branch. And if you did this... So, so what? Which of this do you not? Are you not able to do on <laughs> on GitHub? The point here is that under Travis CI, you're you're implementing the trap the the unit tests through Travis GI. The Travis CI. Uh, this this integrates with GitHub. Mm -hmm. So like, um, are you familiar with the idea of like a pull request? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like. Let's say like you create a branch you for a new feature, you, you would push that up to the repo and then you'd open a pull request and you'd, you'd say like, please like merge my feature into the main base branch of master. So mm -hmm. I'll just show you. Um, so you're a you're non-main, you do a pull request and you say, okay, take this from my repo and put it into the main. Yeah, I actually just did, yeah, that's correct. I actually just did a PR for FreeCAD to get us this added to the add-ons, uh, add-ons workbench. Add-ons uh, workbench. You do the pull request. Sorry, I mean I mean add-ons manager. My bad. <laughs> trying to like. So yeah, I'm, this is add. You did pull requests to have them get the the three D printer workbench in the add-ons manager. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can have. Travis CI, like run your test and it, like prevent merging that code if the build is failing. Like if you're failing tests. Okay. Okay. So it'll it'll show up here when you do your pull request in GitHub and say like hold up like if this was merged you you'd have bugs or you'd have problems so like you better not merge this PR into the main branch. Does GitHub have any inherent? Uh, conflict management like that, like, or you have to go to Travis CI. Like, um, does GitHub have well, any the, inherent tools for this continuous integration, or not, not really? No, no, not okay. not continuous integration. And I, the this the, can you define continuous integration in a paragraph or it, sentence? Yeah. So. Um, I mean, it all comes down to version control systems like Git and like this idea of branching from the main branch. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to branch off, write your new feature, fix your bug, do whatever, and then you want to continuously integrate that back into that main branch. So if they did, if someone did not use Travis CI, then if someone does a pull request, what do they do? Like, are you expecting that, are they also using, like, Travis CI, or? No, I mean, not everyone does. Um, but you would expect the person doing the PR that they, like, ran the test locally themselves and, like, made sure everything still passed, everything was good. So ran the tests either through Travis CI or, like, does Travis or CI like actually? Or, like, locally. Does Travis actually well, do the, the tests? Yeah, it yeah, actually it performs the them automatically, right. but, like, you you can also do that. Um, okay. You know you can just like I was showing you the last time. You can just run those locally. It's doing yeah. the same thing. Okay. 
Um, but this is, it's just kind of like a nice automatic, you know, visual thing that, uh, did they respond? Nice. Yeah. Did they respond yet on whether they're going to do it into add-ons manager? Yeah. So I did two PRs. Like I didn't add an icon to the main FreeCAD repo. And so that got merged already. And then, uh, I'm still waiting on the, the second PR into the add-ons repo and, uh, one guy pinged Yorick like a week ago, and Yorick hasn't responded, so we're just kind of waiting on him. Show me the where it's on FreeCAD that your your work is on merged in there. Uh, yeah, let me show you. So I'll go to the FreeCAD repo. I'll go to merged pull requests, and then here. Oh, wait. Uh, looks like they've been busy. Can I go to my PRs? Contribution activity. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So yeah, this was to add the icon to FreeCAD. And then Yorick said thanks, and he merged it. So he added, let's see, for add-on manager, um, so show me how we're add-on add -ons manager. So this is within FreeCAD, FreeCAD itself? Yeah. And FreeCAD itself, what, what's, what's happening here? It will show this icon for our workbench? or. Yeah, I guess they they need a they need an icon, like so that when you select the workbench, like install it in the add-on manager, they can like preview an icon with it. I'm not sure. Um, oh, let's see, FreeCAD. Or I should go to like FreeCAD 18. Add-ons manager. So so say I Google that. It's on the wiki, the FreeCAD wiki. So let's see. Um, they have like a list. So basically, we should have have the free FreeCAD 3D printer workbench somewhere as an add-on. Like, where do I find that? Like, uh, uh, there's that page on the FreeCAD wiki called External Workbenches that lists all of them. So I had to add add it to the External Workbenches page. Show me, show me that page. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, Okay, let me send this to you. Uh, so if you look in the engineering table at the bottom, Oh, yeah. OSC 3D printer workbench. Whoa. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yep, we're getting into FreeCAD core, too, oh, with man. our icon and stuff. <laughs> oh, what's... how? How's that? Like, uh, FreeCAD core is using... Uh, where are they using it? Uh, let's see here. Wait, and when, when you load up the workbench... I mean, it shows up when you actually install it, right? But I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. I guess that's when they use it. Uh, you install it, and then oh yeah, yeah, that's got to be it. So it, it probably yeah. I'm not sure exactly why, but they just, they just had a list of things to do in order to get your your workbench in the add-ons manager, and that was one of them. So I guess we better uh, click on that OSC 3D printer workbench, which is red now, right now, and make it blue. <laughs> oh yeah, that page. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Um, let's see, I have to remember my login there. Do, do you have uh, permissions to? Oh, edit there it the... is. There it is. Yeah. Um, so cool. I'll just say C C R workbench. Um, 
at the OSC wiki. There it is. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. That looks great. So yeah, I should check. I should check out like all this stuff that they have. There's probably some really useful things in there. You mentioned about FEM. Yeah, that's completely relevant to what we do. I just saw a video the other day on that, and yeah, I think any amateur can start using that. Really. Seems yeah, like. I I think you got to go through some extra steps to get a get some FEM software in order to get the workbench to work. But uh, yeah, it seems really cool to play around with. Oh wow, they got a uh, the gear workbench yeah cool that's awesome yeah like just a little bit more integration on this like pretty soon people will have the ability to design and build anything I mean that's that's basically where I see this going like with the, all the open source tools it's it's like everyone's gonna be a magician in terms of their making capacity pretty soon but pe for most people that's like unforeseeable right now yeah but it's coming mm-hmm I was going to show you that AdSiv wiki website. I, I found that on one of our wiki pages. Yeah, I know and AdSiv. I know AdSiv. That's a pr amazing, uh, they have an amazing wiki interface. He did He did a really good job of kind of like explaining the whole picture. Like, And I feel like it completely oh. aligns with yeah. OSC, like almost 100%. Yeah. Like it's almost like when I was reading it, I'm like... It, did Martian write this? Like, <laughs> that's Charles <laughs> Collis. Yeah, he was a supporter of OSC a long time ago. I don't know what he's doing right now. Yeah, but I actually sent him an email because, like, I was like, "You gotta add more." Like, where are you at with this? Because, like, you know, it aligned it aligned so well. And he he said that he moved on to working with uh, robotics because he feels like in order to you know, build the world that he kind of wanted to see, you would need some kind of like advanced automation through robotics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he's got, he's doing like a PhD and runs some kind of like robotics research lab now. Oh, uh, is he doing any open source stuff? I don't think so. Yeah, that's, that's. Yeah. But uh, I felt, I felt like he had a few pages that kind of really talked about, it. like he talked about like open source CAD being a core component of this, like you need really good open source CAD software to do all of this. Um, and he talks yeah. about FEM yep. and, um, you know, battle testing those uh, design, hardware designs virtually before you go spend the effort, and, uh, you know, in real life to build it. Mm-hmm. Uh, AdSiv.org is it coming up? Uh, it's no, it's down right now. It looks like it. It's not loading for me. Oh. But I, I, I like I like that wiki. Yeah, no, he he did some awesome formatting of all those pages. It's like holy cow, that's. You know, we should get ours that way. <laughs> no, there's a lot to be done on on the formatting part. Uh, I want to show you this just so you know this. Like, um, yeah, let me stop sharing. Let me share my screen for a second, but. You know how I did this here. So you see, this is an example. This is a like this is mm. actually starting to like look like something useful. But um, uh, how do you generate this whole thing? So there's a, this is a template. This whole thing. So you can readily get twenty of these development items. And how do you do that? Do you know? Let's go to test. Just do a test. Actually, was showing somebody else this, but um, but it's a one-liner. It's it's called. Uh, Dev template. Subst. Yeah, you you want to yeah you want to do subst, but uh, dev template. It's actually dev, and that's actually all you need. Like if but no, let's say like if you want to do your project in in our standard hardware development template, you say G's G's a project. And look what it does. No. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Oh wait. No, no, yeah. No, it looks a lot. It zero equals. You got to pass this. You got to pipe in the. That's zero. But that's G's project. That thing. Oh, nice. And it just stubbed everything out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Cool you could thing. crank out wiki pages like that. 
Yeah, yeah, that's... Oh wait, why didn't subst it editing subst dev? Does it have to be capital S? Oh, you know, you know what I was thinking about. Edit. Um, there did it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to. I want a wiki editor mm -hmm. that like has syntax highlighting and like auto complete stuff. Like so, like you know, like to bold text, you got to do like yeah. you know three three single quotes. Yeah. But like when I finish that third single quote, I want it to like finish those other three single quotes mm. and like put my cursor in the middle of it. Or like I want to be able to press control B and do like a keyboard shortcut, you know what I mean? Mm. There is some stuff that can be done on that. We don't really have a person that knows about that. Uh, we we do have a sysadmin that maybe maybe we can ask him to do some of these improvements. We did at one point yeah. test out the there was like a formatting formatting uh, interface and stuff going into edit like the standard thing, the simple thing. It had a bunch of more features in it, but mm -hmm. we actually ended up getting rid of it because it wasn't it was like really not helpful. Complicated, yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, but like it could do like auto completion. So like if mm -hmm. you like if you start typing like s, like it would give you like subst as an option, mm -hmm. and then like you know other things that start with an S as an option yeah. and you just like so you know okay. um, so because like it's 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 hard to remember all the little like yeah. wiki syntax things yeah 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 there could be a lot of facilitation that could happen here yeah let's go going back to the uh, the requirement there so uh, let's go to your log again and then so let's talk about proposal right. um it's up right. a little bit yeah may four wait third uh yeah uh so so let's do a section here on okay what exactly is this part these workbench requirements so obviously um, what do we expect? Definitely, we have a part library of part insertions. So, if you have like, one, how do you add a part to it? Like, if you want to add a new button to create, like, add, like, let's say we're gonna do the, um, what, what would be a new part for the workbench? Uh, like, for example, in the three D printer workbench, it would have. Now it would be more like functions, but a new new like part would like be like the spool, spool holder or something. Yeah. yeah. So you yeah something like that okay so if you know how to do one you can do all of them and that's something that like when i think about collaboration architecture you don't have to be a programmer to do that you can actually be the person that does that that graph that uh cad and then maybe t takes the next step now i want this amount of detail for the workbench so maybe stripping that down from full cad to the proper cad as it should be components yeah yeah um so as we do okay. this we kind of want to keep that in the back of our mind but the part insertions is definitely needed um icons yes. and how to design them yep um, um icons yeah so we've done a little bit of that um how do we so for example for the next workbench like how do we do more icons can i share my screen yeah again yeah okay um, I'm actually a little bit ahead of you on this one. Okay. I made, I made an issue document how to add icons to the workbench. Mm -hmm. So, um, so FreeCAD actually has a really good page on this. Like it goes over like artwork guidelines. Mm. That tells you like oh. colors and you know it's kind of like all here and like contrast and. Highlights and mm -hmm. so it's really it's they have a surprisingly good page page on how to do this. Um, so that's one part of it. Uh, so we would look at, like. Uh, oh shit! Whoopi! What happened? What happened? What'd you do?
temporary interruption here. Okay, let's refresh this. No internet. <coughs> Wait for the internet to get back up. I think we're still recording here, so we're good on that. So maybe let's take a look at... Sorry about uh, that. <clears throat> Power out because we're on uh, off the grid. You're muted. <laughs> Power out outage. We uh, we switched from off grid to on grid. Uh, oh so, really? Because the sun went down. Yeah, we're we're on solar in the house here. Um, okay. Sorry about that. So. Yeah. So uh, yeah, definitely we want to document how to add icons to the workbench. Mm -hmm. um, and document how to add parts. So I just created an issue to document how to add parts. Um, what's next? Uh, parameters for parts? Yeah. Um, yeah, parameters for parts. So you already... You kind of already, already have some of that. Yeah, like, for example, if we're doing a... You know, so let's let's take a look at, like, some of the next machines that we're going to build. Like, a tr let's take the track. Like the, is this what you're talking about? Like, the parameters? Like the size of the frame? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, parameters like that. So you, we already do that. So just extending that. So say we're building the the tractor frame. It's This is uh, like, for example, the like say the tractor cab. We make it such and such dimensions, and you can automatically select dimensions as needed. Uh, so that should be self-explanatory. Uh, parameters for parts to make different sizes um, but also yeah yeah I think we should allow people to do whatever sizes like like for example for the frame you don't put a limit on how small or how big you you make the frame the only constraint there is like all the sides are say equal right now um, which doesn't have to be depending on what you're doing yep um, okay Design rules. So how do we? How yeah, do we that's that? that's kind that's, of a tricky one yeah. is to document the relationships between parts. Yeah. Um, yeah, that'll require some thinking. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably custom. Like for example, if we do the the tractor, like when you have okay, here's gonna be like the engine, the power unit, the power cube. This is how it fits to the frame. Let's say. Like an exploded part diagram. Is that what you're thinking? Well, I mean that kind of stuff has to be like in a design guide which says okay this is how like you have to like say you're programming it whoever's programming it has to know if you put insert frame you want it to be okay put it in the right place don't put it like under the frame put it like <laughs> yeah yeah the frame, yeah right? the relationships yeah. between parts yeah but that's that's pretty much program you say okay if you've got if you insert a a uh, power unit it will allow you to do that only in certain places like right now with the 3d printer workbench or you can have the other way where you're just saying oh it'll just insert you the 
the cab. And that could be like the level one workbench could be you're just inserting the parts without any logic. Would it be possible to do like iterations of, of workbenches where the st like we, we create a protocol where step one, put in all the parts and then like that's the minimalist workbench. And then we say, OK, now we actually add some logic like if you insert the power unit, it will have to go on top of this frame like this. Can we program it in that way, or, or do you have to? Yeah, I think that's the that's the better way to do it. You're thinking already like the programmer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, you definitely want to um, yeah first start with the individual components or parts, and then the relationships would come after that. Because even the simple idea of taking an entire part library and putting buttons in FreeCAD for you to add them, that sub saves you tremendous amounts of work already over downloading them from the wiki and, first of all, knowing which ones you have to use, right? Mm hmm so Definitely. We, so we can call that, like, we can say, you know, say we're actually deploying this process with a lot of different people who can be taught programming, like, with these templates pretty readily, you can have literally like non-programmers add the icons, add the, the actual CAD that goes with them and, and do that level of workbench. I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah, so, I feel like we're getting into overall workbench process. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, because yeah, you would not believe how helpful it is to have like a wiki page that has already like, like with the part library that's broken it up mm -hmm. and like, that's what I translated into code. Like, however you broke up, like, the extruder, mm -hmm. like, here's, like, the blower, here's the um, mm -hmm. motor, here's, you know, these different parts. Like, that's pretty much it mapped one-to-one -one with how I broke it up in the code because, mm -hmm. like, that's how I understood it. That's how it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody who's, like, just a regular user really dissects these hardware parts into like their individual components and comes up with really good names for them like and how they would they fit together mm -hmm. uh, that it's immensely helpful and it maps like one-to-one -one with how it's structured and broken down in the code mm -hmm. so I'm actually thinking so the first step like I see actually three steps first step is you generate the parts Two, you add parameters to them so when yeah you generate yeah. the power cube make it a, like a larger one a smaller one and then step three, you put it in the right place. Yeah. Parameterize um, the parts. Yeah. Ah. But yeah, start with individual parts. So yeah, part of that's icons. Um, you know, breaking it mm -hmm. down. And then, I guess, and then there's like post-processing, like how do you actually get the CAD files, like CAD detailed parts out? Or like fab drawings for, like say you have, so a use case for a tractor would be, at the end of the day, probably someone's gonna weld the frame, so you would probably do, Okay, now for this this size frame that I generated, you actually do a cut list, you know. Mm -hmm. So so fourth step would be cut list and or like the SDL file generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, That's a pretty generic process. Mm -hmm. uh, relationship between parts, cam, CAD generation. Where where would cut list fall into CAD and CAM generation? Cut list um, is a separate thing from them because uh, yeah. VOM generation is you getting the parts listed with their lengths. CAM is you actually extracting the detail, which you put in a separate menu. Yeah, but you extract the actual detail CAD, and then cut yeah cut list. It's kind of like a final thing alongside with cam generation, I guess. Well, then there's like fabrication drawings, which we haven't done here because uh, yeah. it's like 
you know, fabrication drawings are pretty cool, but in the 3D printer case, they're not highly useful because, I mean, well, no, they would be useful. They, they can still, you can still give it to, like, say, say somebody who's, because I what I would do is I would look at FreeCAD and, and get all the information out of FreeCAD by spinning it in 3D, but if somebody doesn't know how to use FreeCAD, they can just take a look at the CAD drawings and say, oh, okay, this is how I put it together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, how do we want to scope this out? So, so like, fourth is the cut lists. Um, just kind of itemizing the cam files, which are cam STLs. Um, Sucks to be like fabrication. I mean, do we want to get into try to get into that that all of that, or we're kind of going too far out? Maybe we should cut it off. That there's the yeah, the, f the fabrication drawings that that kind of can be handled by other workbenches, like the tech draw workbench, I think. Yeah. So I don't know if like we necessarily document that within individual workbenches, but we just have that as part of like the open source ecology wiki. Like this is the process for going from you know digital prototyping to physical prototyping yeah yeah or, or generating like assets that correspond to different designs and parts yeah okay so get that out of there um, what about like the cam as like the STLs for the generated parts that's something that's specific to the workbench because say you modified the corner well that corner is not available anywhere else mm -hmm. it's, it's like we actually generated it so yeah we should be, should be able to get it extract it right mm -hmm. and cut list so, so, but that's it I think that's scope it out at that that's it yeah with the, with the cam generation like had the corner been a separate button like we wouldn't have had to consider that as like a separate feature it would just kind of come out of the box with um, free CAD. So I don't know. So, what other common things do all these things have? Like, I mean, what you did in the free in the three D printer workbench. I mean, it kind of embodies all the kind of steps where you want to do for the other workbenches. So, the only other thing I could think about is like, say, there's a part that comes from another workbench. How do you access it? Well, I guess you just go navigate into the other workbench. Don't put it in a specialized workbench. Like, say, if the um what's an yeah example? so yeah. so like i think that like like the power cube like that could be applicable to the tractor but that could also be applicable to some other kind of hydraulic yeah. or mechanical yeah. based machine um so i think we'd have to come up with like the same idea like there's part libraries but you'd have like a repo a corresponding like github repository and then the tractor workbench and whatever else would both pull that common part like a power cube from there but we're not i don't think we're really there yet mm -hmm. yeah yeah but, but yeah you'd have you'd have like some kind of like part library but like a repo for that Well, say the power cube that would come from its power cube workbench but we're just saying like that workbench would be separate so if you want to put a power cube into the tractor um, we could abstract it so that the the oh, yeah. power cube geometry is separate from the power cube workbench. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So yeah. that yeah, so so you'd have like the power cube, um, like geometry library, and then the workbench for the power cube and the tractor workbench can both pull that in. Yeah, 
I mean, we, we might have some requirements like the power cube because these are like the engines that we use and we know that they work. Like we could have some standard ones, but yeah, because because when you like the power of these workbenches comes in when when you specify it to very particular real parts. Like, don't let a person design just any size and shape of a power cube because there's really no components that are sh shaped that way that make it work. So it's like don't allow it. We should probably impose that. Like just allow only the allowed geometries that we know work work and the, yeah because, yeah i think that is the real value is yeah, like yeah, we've yeah. actually We've prototyped and it. tested these things yeah yeah that's the value added so you don't do just bs design which is no you can't actually build it to okay this is actually an engineered design based on known parts yeah yeah but my laptop's about to die hold on get a plug in yeah so what else do we need? I think, I mean, I think our list kind of covers That's this. a pretty good, yeah. I mean, I think mm -hmm. if we cover all that in 90 days, it's gonna be oh, yeah. pretty set. Yeah, yeah. How long do you think it's gonna take you to each do each of the steps? So so to do like the, the generator of the skeleton directory structure. And for example, for the generator of the directory structure, that would happen, like I'm on, on my desktop and I would be working in what? And I would be working in Docker? Or uh, you probably it probably just you need to install Python maybe, and then yeah. So I think that comes from OSE Linux. We've got Python, like yeah. Really so if have you have oh, Python is actually installed in any Linux, I think. Yeah. Um. So yeah, you run like some kind of command that's documented to generate it. You pass it like the name as a parameter, and then it spits you out a new workbench. Um. I would say that would take me like two weeks. So like a sprint. Okay, and that way you've actually generated this directory structure, like this folder of stuff? Yeah, it'll generate you the folder, and then uh, you'll be able to load up FreeCAD and you know, select that new workbench from the dropdown and like click a button to, like to add a box or something. So and kind of see how yeah, that code's set up to like modify it for whatever you want to do. Wait, so would this be specific to Linux? then or this is on any system yeah it's cross-platform because Python would be like cross-platform but if okay but so you said that you generate the, the directory structure you generate this this workbench on one's computer but would it be in a container or no it would just be like on your physical so it's drive. on your physical com but but I mean that will differ between if you've got Linux or Windows or Mac right like the directory um, structure will be different or no oh well like i'm talking about like creating just a repository not like sticking it inside of wherever freecad needs it so how do you run freecad with that workbench then well you'd have to just know that for your operating system you'd have so to know you... like where to stick that folder Okay, okay. So you'll generate the folder and we're going to th throw that basically into mod, right? Where, yeah, you yeah, and you're going to know like on Windows that you have to go to this directory versus okay. Linux. You got to go some, oh, okay. some other So basically you're going to generate this thing that now we can put into mod and we can run this workbench and actually like within those folders you'll you'll have like the the blank files that we can generate whatever like start generating stuff like generate our first part and you know insert this part into FreeCAD right right cool yeah okay that's awesome and is the n nature of this project that you'll basically be working out how to get that skeleton as refined as possible so it'll be essentially a template that that you work with so you'll go I mean how much of the functionality for any workbench do you think you can get out of this basic skeleton before you have to like really custom code it? Uh, I don't think you'll have much functionality. Like, y you might. There's a concept right. of like boilerplate code. So like you'd have like something simple like a button to create a box, and you're like, okay, well, I don't want a box. I want like you know a part of a tractor. So I'm gonna have to figure out, you know, replace the code that makes a box with like the part of with code that you know, generates a, a tractor part. Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, and for example, for things like, 
parametrizing that box, how much of that, like it depends on what, what geometry you're starting with to how that code is going to look. So you can't really seed that or skeleton that out too much, right? Yeah, there there wouldn't be like too much that you can seed or skeleton, but that's the the idea of having the the other like the framework or library, mm -hmm. um, that this skeleton of code would depend upon. Then you'd be able to look in this library and it have all these like common functions that you can leverage, that you know manipulate geometries in a certain way and and do other like common operations to make your life easier. Uh, this common library would be part of this basic skeleton. Yeah, I'm, well, it wouldn't be part of it. It'd be like a separate thing, but it would be set up so that you could depend upon this common library. Uh, I'm not really getting this common library. Would let me let me let me share parts, or let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Um. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. Um, so you would have this generator. Mm -hmm. It generates like the basic skeleton or scaffolding project. Yep. And you'd have some dependency, like in that ge generated skeleton project, on this library. You could call it like the core. And what would the core? What exactly would be the extent of the core? Like cutlass generation would be in there, for example. So you'd pass it you know like a list of mm -hmm. uh you know basically things with like quantity and description mm -hmm. and and length and it's going to generate you it's going to have like the the freecad see. little panel and know how to turn that into like an exportable list or a ta wiki table whatever so that would be an mm -hmm. example of something that would be in there mm -hmm. so um, it's functional just, functional libraries yeah the, like i sometimes i create stuff for like making um, like manipulating certain geometries like in FreeCAD a little bit easier so mm -hmm. like you, you know f there are like vertexes that make up edges that make up faces and then faces make up like solids and there's kind of this hierarchy of how to build like a geometry in CAD mm -hmm. um, so there could be like functions that you know make it easier to build like more complex geometries mm. with inside of that library just whatever whatever kind of is kind of like a general purpose thing that might be yep. useful to any workbench yep okay I, I don't, yeah I don't know exactly what would be in it that's kind of what the next 90 days will be is kind of figure thinking out. more about yeah okay and the workbench generator that's a that would be a Python program yeah this would be a Python program um, and You'd have to like clone it or something, and then read its README, and then run a command, and then you get like a skeleton of a new workbench. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the basic parameter you pass into is basically like the name of the workbench, or would exactly, be yeah, yeah. That's you call it, is, it like right? tractor, and it yeah. generate you a directory mm -hmm. called OSC tractor workbench. Yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, that sounds awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah, sounds like we're pretty much on the same page. Just yeah. trying to make it really replicable and scalable, and yeah. get get the yeah. ball rolling. Let's get all done by twenty twenty eight. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and we can retire. <laughs> retire for the next time. Until <laughs> at that point, we get to applications to addressing all pressing world issues. So yeah, the the good stuff. <laughs> Rather than the detailed technical minutia. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Sounds good. So I think we're good for now then? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Awesome. I feel like this productive meeting is good. Okay. Okay. Well, I look forward to it. And yeah, thanks again. And congratulations on completing this awesome workbench. And we'll continue to use it. For me, the, the basically, the, the first use case is going to be after doing this. Maybe I'll be able to take the existing workbench and modify it to the version with the one inch universal axis. So I'll be, think about that as a use case. 
So basically okay. we're making the rods larger and the 3D printed pieces larger. I think everything else is pretty much, well, there's probably some little bit of, there might be some custom design on how we make the, it depends how we do it, but we can actually still use the existing corners and the same bolt pattern to do even the larger axis. That would be, um, you know, at the end of the day, you want to optimize it for the larger axis, but this, the current frame and corners would already work with the one inch universal axis. So that could perhaps be a good te test case. We're taking frame and corners are the same, and now Marchin's going to add the large axis to it. So we're actually modeling the, the real uh, larger axes for much larger printers. Because already you can scale the angles and corners to like huge. Like you can do practically, well, anything, but a practical use case would be like a quarter by four angle, which is, I mean, that's pretty strong, pretty strong stuff. Uh, and with that, you can do like eight by eight printers, no problem. So that will be like a good good thing and I, I could do that hopefully at the result as a result of uh, this new skeleton yeah yeah that would be really exciting yeah that'd be cool yeah cool I'll, I'll definitely keep that in mind and yeah, and yeah maybe that'll be our, our goal as <laughs> after the 90 days yeah Marcin had some <laughs> inch access yeah and then I can say cool. wow I programmed my first FreeCAD <laughs> uh, workbench and that it's funny because uh, like when you're so I know Yorick when he told me, because he started out, he knew no Python, and then become he pretty much quickly became one of the lead developers for for FreeCAD. So he started oh, from really? nothing. He's an architect, and uh, then he just learned. I was like, "What? How do you learn like the kernel, the programming, and this and that?" To me, it seemed like it was impossible. But now that I look at it, it's like, you know, I'm getting familiar with FreeCAD and a little Python. It's like, oh yeah. This works. We can do it. You got the the Python console underneath. It's all Python and definitely doable. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Super friendly. Yeah. So I'm not scared of that proposition anymore. I could see myself definitely <laughs> doing it, and people uh, actually being able to do that, and many people being able to do that. Just you just got to teach teach people how to do that. Yeah, one way. thing that I thought would be really cool is like we have Slack or Discord and then, you know, we, we establish like when somebody onboards with OSC because they think that what we're doing is so great and they want to be a part of it, like you don't just, you know, onboard and like, like you'd, you'd have like a mentor or you'd have like, you know, somebody that's kind of like looking out for your welfare and like, you know, your transition to be a part of that organization and like, um, includes you on things and then you know it's there to get their brain picked by that person as much as possible um, and you know can like rapidly uh, reduce their barrier to entry by teaching them like everything they know and getting them up to speed with like what's going on and you know yeah um, so like I just like I've you know, like in programming that's super important because like you know what we do is complicated and uh, it's it's kind of a hard discipline, so it's it's really important to have like, you know, relationships with other people that and in like communication lines that are open. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting on screen shares and helping someone debug something, like stuff like that. Yeah, we have a Slack channel. We should get you in there. Uh, I I'm on it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not too active. Uh, Eric posts a lot of stuff on there. <laughs> yeah. No one else does. <laughs> um, discourse is coming, and for discourse, I was going to ask you like, uh, I want to get like really good contributor. So I was looking into also contributor guidelines. I want to basically cherry pick from some of the best social contracts out there and create one for ourselves that pretty much combines all the best practice. Uh, but also one of the things I wanted to say, like when we, whenever, like I don't want to have any any threads that are just like unmanaged. We need moderators for everything to keep the qual. I'd like to keep the quality of the discussion up because that's why I mean we had a forum before, but it kind of collapsed because it was no one was managing it. So, and I'd like to ask you, of course, then if you can basically moderate the FreeCAD development side of it. So we'd have we'd have like our major development areas. So there would be like FreeCAD. It would be three D printing be tractors and all that but we really need a moderator for each topic to get that according to OSC spec you know otherwise it just goes yeah. all over the place which you just go could go to any form for that but here we want to create something extraordinary so 
get the definitely. proper proper guidance there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd definitely be interested in that. I, I kind of have like more of a uh, like a mentorship role at my current like full time organization, so definitely interested in that. Mentoring uh, people who are coming on. Yeah, like yeah, I, I do a lot of onboarding training, uh, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Excellent. That'd be good. Yeah, I mean, I could imagine like if you could like eventually like once this as this thing grows, we have this free cut development and you can yeah you can facilitate the onboarding process there and it's easy. They can ask you questions. That would be awesome. And then we have this this thing that just keeps growing and get get those fifty work benches up as soon as we can. Yeah. <laughs> be yeah. exciting. Yep. Okay. All right. All right, Marcin. Well, yeah, uh, I will talk to you later. I'll keep you up to date with uh, what I'm doing and what's going on. And um, yeah, man, I, I wish you a good weekend. Yep. Thank you. So yeah, we'll keep yep. in touch. Take care. All right. Awesome. You too. Bye-bye.